dear Father in heaven, we thank you for another beautiful day, second day of our full day of our camp meeting. We thank you for the blessings you've been pouring out on us. Please be with us as we come to learn from your book of nature and we ask that you will give us not only physical guidance but spiritual guidance. Enlighten our minds, help us to grasp the mechanical concepts, the mathematical concepts that will give us our bearings so that we can know our whereabouts and help us to grasp those spiritual facts that will help us maintain our spiritual whereabouts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Some of you may have read this story already. It just came out. From Dr. Mark Turnbull, Vanuatu Project. It was a Sabbath morning a few weeks ago when the phone rang. The local district pastor of the Adventist church informed me that three young boys from a small Adventist community on Multilava Island in remote Torba province had gone missing the night before. The boys, 11, 13, and 14 years old, were fishing in a small leaky boat with a dodgy eight horsepower outboard engine just outside the reef off their small island. When they failed to get home by Friday sunset, everyone was concerned. So Dr. Turnbull has a plane that was set up for search and rescue. And they went out flying, looking for the boys. We spent that entire Sabbath searching, but in vain. We used our GPS to comb up and down the ocean around Multilava in a grid. So they wondered if they would miss the tiny boat. It was a rainy day, so they were grounded at, at Motolava Airstrip part of the time. And then a northwesterly wind picked up during the afternoon. So when we talk about wind direction, what are we talking about? The direction it goes, comes from or goes to? So the wind was coming from the northwest. There was much confusion about the direction of the ocean currents in that area. Later we realized that when we were asking about currents, most were thinking of the movement of the tides within the reef, which is a totally different thing. This proved to be a major obstacle in finding the boys, as the general idea among the locals was that the boys must have drifted in a northwesterly direction, pulled by what they termed tides, against the wind. In Bislama, the local language, tides and currents are not differentiated. I was in contact with a friend and experienced yachtsman. Brian Dodds, who was thousands of miles away in Queensland, Australia. Brian has sailed many times in this part of Vanuatu and is very experienced and knowledgeable in regards to the currents. He gave me a set of GPS points to investigate, far off to the southeast of Motolava, which went directly against the wave of excitement stirred up by wrong ideas of tides versus currents, a false vision, and the witch doctors who had said that the spirits had stolen the boys and hidden them in the stones on an island. After visiting all but one of Brian's GPS points, we felt that our search and rescue mission was coming to an end. But as we left Brian's final GPS, and this was Sunday morning, I believe. As we left 
Brian's final GPS point on a last effort approach towards Motalaba, there in front of us was a small red boat with three boys in it. They had huddled at the front of the boat to keep the leaky hole in the stern above the water. So then the airplane was able to radio their position in and guide the police boats in to finish the rescue. So as we look at our situation, most of us are not pilots or boat captains. In some ways we have it a whole lot easier because we have a lot of things we can see. Mountains, hills, roads, trails, trees. Up in the air, above the clouds, or out on the open sea, there's none of that. There's basically no visible point of reference. So the pilots and the mariners have quite an extensive um, training navigation to cope with their life and land needs. We want to cover some basics of navigation that will enable us to navigate on land as well as anywhere else. And to just begin with, we're going to look at some basic facts about our Earth. Okay, so here we have a globe. I think we're all familiar with this. You know what this is? North Pole. And you know what this is? Yep. And then there is a little mark right here. And you know what that is? It's the North Magnetic Pole. It's off by about almost 15 degrees south of the North Pole on approximately 102 or 3 degrees as of the making of this globe. Now if we look at the other end, let's see if it has. Okay, here we go. Here's the magnetic south pole and it is would you believe it? Outside the Arctic Circle. It is here at approximately 65 degrees from the pole. I mean, from the equator. So 90 degrees to the pole. Another fact is, you'll notice this globe is not straight up and down. It's tilted. You know how much it's tilted? 23 degrees, 27 minutes, which is about half a degree. There's 60 minutes in a degree. So, 23 and a half. Who knows what the difference is between summer and winter? Okay, if you're the sun and I turn this this way, what season is it in the northern hemisphere? If I turn it this way, what season is it? Yep. And when I turn it this way, what season is it? Spring or fall. Okay, two of them. Spring and fall. The other fact we deal with is time zones. So how 
many time zones are there in the world? One hour time zones. <laughs> At any given time, for someone standing on one point in the earth, everywhere around the globe, there's going to be 23 other time zones, and then man has complicated it with one more thing, and that's daylight saving time, where they put you one hour earlier according to the clock. So that's the equivalent of here, Pacific time zone. Mountain time zone. It's like for the summer you hop over in the mountain time zone, except the sun still comes up at the same time. <laughs> so, a lot of socialist countries run daylight saving time year round. They did in Zambia where I was born. But when we're working with nature, wherever we are, Local noon is wherever the sun reaches the highest point in the sky, where it's due south. Or if you're in the southern hemisphere, where would it be? Yep. Due north at noon, if you're in the southern hemisphere. So let's say right now we suddenly found ourselves somewhere. You know, normally we look and the sun comes up on the left, goes across, and sets on the right. So, that's the northern hemisphere. So what would it be in the southern hemisphere? We would be looking up this way. The sun would rise over here and swing around and set on the left. So, if you get spirited away to some place and wake up and don't know where you are, and the sun moves backward, just know you're south of the equator. So, I think we know what the equator is. It's the halfway point between here and here. The equal part. Okay, now let's talk about the moon. The moon, I've been in Alaska in October and watched the moon come up over here and swing around like that and set. The moon basically follows a equatorial path, but it does vary a little bit. So it varies instead of 23 and a half degrees, it's only about five degrees that it varies from the equator. So from what I was reading at the pole, the exact physical North Pole and South Pole, every year they have six months of winter, total darkness, six months of summer, which is basically total light. Because the sun doesn't go up and down, it just goes around. Now there's nobody who spends any amount of time there to watch it, but it is possible to get there. People have done it. So, at those same points where you have six months of day and six months of night, you would have two weeks where you couldn't see the moon and two weeks where the moon was constantly visible. Otherwise, it just kind of rides the horizon. Now, it was interesting reading in Joseph Bates' autobiographies. He told about sailing from up here in the northern hemisphere down to South America. That brings us to stars. Sailors use stars a lot for navigation. They can use the sun, too, but the stars give them more information. So, as he sailed, they would use the stars to determine where they were. So, in the northern hemisphere, what is the one star that tells us that basically stays in the same place in the sky all the time? 
North, North, North Star. They call it Polaris. It's just the pole star. So it's way up there, right in line with the axis of the Earth. So as the Earth spins, that star appears to stay in the same spot. Now that's going to be very useful to us. So let's say we flip this over, and we're standing here in Argentina somewhere. Are you going to be able to see the North Star? No. Now Joseph Bates said that in his experience sailing from North America to South America, and around the bottom of South America and up the other side, here at the equator, there's a four degree belt where you can't see the North Star or the South Star. Because it's just right on the horizon and going away while the other one's coming up. And you just can't tell where either one is. So at four degrees, it's about what, 250 miles. Um, a degree is 69.5 statute miles of latitude. It's 60 nautical miles. on the Earth's surface. But when he got across that belt and was coming down in this way, he got past the four degree mark. What could he see up here? Southern Cross. Yep, Southern Cross. It's a constellation of about five stars. And who knows the name of the pole star in the south? Um, I'm drawing a blank on it too, and I have it written down here if I can find it. No, it is... Um, Alpha Crucis, that's what it is. Alpha Crucis, yeah, there it is, okay. So that's the brightest star in the Southern Cross, and it is the Pole Star, which allows everyone south of the equator to figure out which way is south. Now, we do not have the ability to go out and look to see where the Southern Cross is here. But how many of you are comfortable locating the North Star in the night sky? Okay. All right, you have to be able to see stars. Okay, it looks like the majority of you do. Um, Satellites move. <laughs> right. Most of the fixed position satellites are running around the equator. And you really don't see them. They're out way far. 10, 20 times as far as most of the ones you see. So, right. Ursa Major. Mm -hmm. So Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, those are the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. Okay, so do you know which constellation the North Star is part of? Little Dipper. It's the Little Dipper. But the easiest way to find the North Star is to look at the... Uh, the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is the easiest one to find, and then, you know, the handle comes around, and it has the bowl. So you line up the two stars on the front of the bowl, and those point you right to the North Star, which is on the end of the handle for the Little Dipper. So, if you can find those pointer stars on the Big Dipper, you should be able to locate the Little Dipper as long as a cloud or something isn't in the way of it. Also, the uh, when you can't see all the other stars, the Big Dipper is like one of the brightest constellations in the sky. Yes. So when you can't see anything, 
You can always find your navigation stars. Yes, the navigation stars are the easiest ones to find, usually. That's a good idea. Okay, he's asking for us to demonstrate on the whiteboard. Now, I'm not an astronomy expert, so I will just do my best. But if the... I may need to not even have the right number of stars here. We need bigger dots. Okay. You know, a good astronomer could correct me in. Okay. Is that a... I'm not sure if that was a star or not. Anyway. Can you see that any better? <laughs> yeah. Those are the kind of stars I see when I fall down on my head. <laughs> okay. So here's your pointer stars. your North Star. So does that help? Okay. So that's a good illustration. Okay, so I need to talk a little bit about math. Okay, so how many degrees are there in a circle? 360. 360. Okay, how many days are there in a prophetic year? The prophetic year was 12 months of 30 days and 360 days. And that's basically where our 360 degree circle division came from. Was the number of days in a year. But it, instead of being 365.24, blah, 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 it's just divided up in 360, which is a little easier to work with. So if we divide 360 by 24 hours in a day, what's that? 15. So how wide is a time zone? 15 degrees. A time zone is 15 degrees of longitude. Okay, so what's longitude? Top to bottom. It's these lines running this direction. Okay, what's latitude? It's these lines running this direction. Right. Parallel to the equator is latitude. Perpendicular to the equator is longitude. So, if the Earth is tilted at a 23 and a half degree angle, where is the Tropic of Cancer? The Tropic of Capricorn? the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic Circle. They're all 23 and a half degrees from something. It, Cancer and Capricorn. Tropic of Cancer is in the Northern Hemisphere. Tropic of Capricorn is in the Southern Hemisphere. These are the 23 and one half. Parallel. So, the Tropic of Cancer, the most northerly vertical rays of the sun, like if you're the sun and I tip it this way, if you were looking straight at the center of the ball, you would be looking at the Tropic of Cancer. 
you spin it around this way and you look straight at the center of the ball, you're looking at the Tropic of Capricorn. So the Tropic of Cancer runs just north of Hawaii, runs right through central Mexico, about halfway between Laredo and Mexico City. And the Tropic of Capricorn runs through Chile, Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil. Over in Africa, it runs through Namibia, Botswana, just misses Zimbabwe, runs through South Africa, and into Mozambique and Madagascar. And then it goes around and runs pretty much through the middle of Australia, a little bit to the north of the middle. So anything between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn is what we call the tropics. Your days are pretty much 12 hours, your nights are pretty much 12 hours all year long. And part of the time the sun runs over this way and part of the time it runs over this way. It goes back and forth overhead, but it doesn't make a lot of difference. It's pretty much straight overhead. And of course we're all familiar with the land of the midnight sun and the land of the eternal night. <laughs> it goes on and on and on and at the very pole it's six months a day and six months a night. Now someone pointed out, I don't think God intended for very many people to live up there. <laughs> the North Pole is completely ocean frozen solid. And the South Pole is land frozen solid with a couple miles of ice on it. So neither one is a very pleasant place to be. Okay, now that was a long explanation. Question. Yes, so go ahead. Sunsets, well, sunrise at 6, sunsets at 6. Pretty much all, day, all year long. Yeah, in the tropics, correct. Now between the tropics, okay, the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic Circle is where you begin to get a 24-hour day and a 24-hour night once a year. So in between the tropics and the Arctic, what do we call it? Oh. It's like one of the fruits of the Spirit. <laughs> we call it the temperate zone. The temperate zone, it's neither tropical nor arctic. It's kind of halfway in between. We actually have something resembling four seasons. Summer, winter, spring, and fall. And... And of course, the 45th parallel is exactly halfway between the equator and the North Pole. And there's one in the north and one in the south. Okay, so if we have 15 degrees per time zone, if you see the sun move 15 degrees across the sky, how long did that take? One hour. So if you see it move one degree, you're able to measure one degree of solar movement. How long is that? Four minutes. Four minutes. Yep. So you can see how if we have a compass that enables us, like these here, a little orienteering compass, I know it's too far away to see, but this dial is divided into two degree marks. So if you take a heading and the sun is at, say, 120 degrees, and later it's at 123 degrees, how many minutes is that of time? 12 minutes. 
So, the, one of the most useful things about a compass is it gives us a protractor that we can use to measure angles. We can make our own protractor, but to really be accurate about it is, it takes some work. So we all know if we divide, we have a line going north and south, how many degrees from north to south? 180. 180. East and west, again, are 180 apart. So, west to north? 90. 90. Okay, what's half of 90? 45. 45. What's half of 45? Too hard. It's 22 and a half. <laughs> so what's half of 22 and a half? 11 and a quarter. So we can get down, just by slicing the pie, we can get down to 11 and a half degree increments. I mean 11 and a quarter degree. We can do it by folding a piece of paper like a paper airplane and we can come up with those increments. So hopefully this bit of geometry will prove useful to us. The next thing, where's another protractor that some of us carry on us? We wear one on our wrist. How many marks are there on that? Depends on your watch. If you have a... Um, a digital watch, you might have to draw one. <laughs> it's not too hard to draw one that has all the hours represented. So on your watch, you have two hands, three hands. One is your second hand, which is kind of irrelevant for what we're doing. And you have your hour hand, which goes all the way around every hour. So that's 360 degrees in an hour. Now, the minute hand, right? The minute hand, that's it. Then the hour hand is the slowest moving one. How long does it take to do 360 degrees? 24. 12. 12 hours. So compared to the movement of the sun around the earth, how fast is it going? Not a chair for you, Daddy. It's going twice as fast. So now, do you understand how we can use our watch as a protractor to calculate time? What we do is we use something, a knife blade actually works really well. Um, we put our knife blade up so that it's shadow falls directly across the pivot point on the watch hand. And then we turn our watch until that shadow is lying directly between the hour hand and noon. Because remember, the hour hand's moving twice as fast as the sun. So if it's 9 o'clock, we drop the shadow across the pivot through the 10.30 area. Then if we look in a line from 6 to 12 across the watch, we're looking at due south according to the sun. Now the one thing that's going to mess you up is if you're on daylight saving time, you need to figure the watch hand as being an hour earlier, whether it's morning or afternoon. Otherwise, you'll just be off by 15 degrees on your final direction. The other thing is, is if you're not right in the middle of the time zone, you're going to need to be able to calculate how far off you are. Now we can take our position off a map, and we can use it to tell time, or we can take our time off the sun, compare it with a watch, and use that to determine our position on the map. It's going to go one way or the other based on which data you have. If you know your position on the map, you can find the time. If you 
physically determine local time by the sun, you can find your position on the map for longitude. Latitude's pretty easy. So what would we do at night? Because at night it's going to be a lot easier. What are we going to do at night to determine our latitude? You're on. Exactly, the North Star or the South Star, depending on. It's not absolutely precise, but it's within like two degrees. So that would get you within 150 miles on the surface of the Earth. So how would we go about measuring our angle to the North Star? One thing you can do is if you can find a pole, like the top of the tent here, there's a pole sticking up, or the top of a tree that doesn't blow around too much, go out at night, find the North Star, and get in line with the top of that pole, and follow that alignment right to the ground and drive a stake in. Now you have a physical point of reference, and you can measure the angle to the North Star. Then you know your latitude. Like I say, it's not pinpoint accurate, but it'll give you a figure to within as accurate as you are. No. But how would we measure that angle? Well, you can build your own protractor, but if you have one of these, you know what a plumb bob is? If you can make a plumb bob, tie a weight on a string and hang it, and then run that string parallel to the lines, or on your compass, and then sight your bearing on the angle to the North Star. You can use this for measuring slopes, and inclinometers, what they call it. It's tricky doing it that way, but, and if you have an inclinometer, it makes it easier, but who carries one of those around all the time? Not most of us. So there's different ways you can improvise to measure that angle and that will give you your latitude. Longitude was the great battle of the ancient mariners coming out of the Dark Ages. They could not figure out how to accurately tell where they were. Longitudinally. And there were a lot of men who were lost on some notorious reefs because they just couldn't tell when they were getting there. Out in the middle of the ocean, there's nothing to take a bearing off of. And especially in the fog or in the storm, they couldn't tell when they were near it. So this one man determined that if he could build a clock that would keep time on a ship, he could determine, based on the stars, what their longitude was, or the sun. He worked, and he worked, and he worked, and he worked, and he never could make a clock that would keep time on a ship that's always swaying. You know what the solution was? Yeah. A watch. The parts were small enough they weren't affected by the swaying of the ship. So, all it took was an accurate watch. They would set that watch and keep it going. And that's where universal coordinated time came from. Have you ever heard of Greenwich Mean Time? That's what they called it in Africa. And when I talked to some fellows over in England, we were discussing time zones and I mentioned universal coordinated time, UTC. I say, what are you talking about? Over here, it's Greenwich Mean Time. <laughs> I say, I know that. I was born in a British-influenced country. 
So, Greenwich, England. Just a little bit east of London is zero degrees of longitude. Okay, so one more little fact of geography. 180 degrees from there, what do we find? The International Dateline. That's where on the east side, it's Sunday, and a millimeter away on the west side, it's Monday. And you didn't see the difference. <laughs> I think it's kind of like time zones. If you live right on the edge of a time zone and all the people are on the other side, you set your watch according to their time zone. <laughs> What country does the international dateline go through? It takes a jog to avoid running through Russia, and instead it goes through the Bering Strait, and then it crosses over and takes in all of the Aleutian Islands that belong to Alaska. So it's kind of a tit for tat there. Some on one side, some on the other. And then we get down to the Kiribati Island area. It takes a jog to the east, goes past West Samoa, kind of through the Samoa Islands down past Tonga, and just south of New Zealand, it comes back onto the longitudinal line. So New Zealand is Monday when we're Sunday. If you're in Fiji or Samoa, mm -hmm. Western Samoa, you can have your birthday on one day, like on Sunday, then uh, you can fly to American Samoa and have a birthday again. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they asked Ellen White about the problem of the date line when it came to Sabbath observance. She just said, God made a round world and he made the Sabbath for a round world. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> go with one or the other, but that's something that you just need to know what part of the world you're in. Fortunately, not too many of us have that problem, because the dateline goes through some of the less habitable parts of the earth, just a few ocean islands. Okay, so a nautical mile, again, it's one minute of latitude or longitude. 60 minutes in a degree, there are 60 seconds in a minute. So when you read GPS coordinates, it could be either degrees with a decimal point and however many zeros, or it could be degrees and minutes and seconds out to however many decimals. Okay, so if one degree is 69 statute miles, 60 nautical miles, one minute is how many miles? How many nautical miles? One nautical mile. So a uh, second of angle is how far? 160th of 6,000 
76.115 feet. That would be roughly 100 feet. So when you divide the Earth up into degrees, minutes, and seconds of angle, you are pinpointing a location to within about 100 feet. Yes. All I can say is to turn the Earth upside down or flip it 180 degrees on its axis or however God chooses to do it at that time. That is a piece of work with absolutely devastating implications that we are not able to foresee the consequences of very effectively. How the Earth doesn't simply explode is a miracle. But that's what the Lord tells us when He delivers His people. Midnight turns into midday. Midday turns into midnight. So when the Lord comes to shake terribly the earth, if He wants to shake something, He can shake it. Bad. And that's our salvation. Therefore shall not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. It's our Father doing it. He's not going to let one grain of wheat fall to the ground. Okay. Um, we've used up a full hour of our time. Why don't we go ahead now and take a walk out to our sundial out here and look at some interesting facts and discuss what we can do with it. So if our camera can just... One thing the thing I want to show you here is even though the sun is rising and going around the sky in a circle and the earth is round and everything else, stand in line with these sticks and look at them. Oh, wow. They're in a straight line. So which way does that line go? Towards the sunrise. Where you going? It goes east and west, precisely, according to our solar time here. But when you see the sun. So, we get this line going east and west. We know that at 6 in the morning, the sun will be over there. At 6 in the evening, the sun will be over there. So, if we get a perpendicular angle from that line, we have a... North and south. North and south. So, where is the sun at noon? Straight okay, south. So, so, if we measure 90 degrees off that line, how would you get an accurate 90 degrees square off the line? Two equal length sides of your triangle. Yeah. Probably the easiest way to do it would be once we get this line drawn, mm -hmm. yep. and we could do right now, yeah. we could put a stake in over here, and take a piece of string and fold it in half, mm -hmm. and measure exactly the same distance this way and this way. You 
which we can do with a stick. And then have a string that's probably three times as long as that stick. And pull it from that point out and back to the line. The middle of that string, when we fold it in half, that will be your 90 degree point. So that will be south. What timing would that correlate with? I think without a demonstration, I don't, think, I don't think they're going to follow that. Except for the smart people. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't follow that. We need to do it in order to a demonstration. show it. Right. We need to do it. Let me um, see if I can round up the string while you go ahead and Chris? do something else. Go ahead. What is it? Yeah, the half compass. What is that? Is that a compass? That is a compass. Yeah, I pulled a magnet off the fridge, floated it, pulled a magnet off the fridge, floated it in a plastic lid in a pan of water. So it's showing north here or this way? It's we might, north we might have a little problem. It might be touching the side, so it might be... Yeah, yeah. just blow it around a little. The, the magnet is... See, now it's, it's turning a little bit. Now magnet, it's getting a little bit... Uh, uh, so the magnet? So the north is oh. this way. Any magnetic object can be floated like that, and it will give you a compass. That's all a compass is, is a magnet that floats nicely. <laughs> no, that's, it's, not, it's not strong enough to go fast. It's fixed. It's, it's, it's very slow. It's actually already turning. It's already up towards the magnetic line. So, we can compare that with this east west one. But this also has for eight, ten dollars to give us the ability. We have a mirror with a line across it, and we can sight effectively and easily get headings within two degrees. The main thing you have to watch is any steel you're wearing, whether it's on your watch, whether it's in your pocket, hmm. be above your belt buckle. You want it to be horizontally oriented without interference from metal objects on your person, steel objects. Aluminum won't affect it so much. How do you magnetize the tip of a needle if you're trying to use that for a um, Hard steels hold magnetism best. Okay, what I get, my measurement right now, is indicating 67 degrees. Okay, so I tried to get the compass lined up at the pivot point with a line going across those stakes. I came up with a reading of 13 degrees, which actually impresses me. Before we came here, I looked this location up, this address, on a declination calculator. And the declination that was given on the calculator was 14 degrees and one minute. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, you can let up your. Does that look about lined up? Yep. Okay, let's let the tension off. Okay. So now. That should be pretty much on the east west line. If we wanted to make it really accurate, we would actually stretch it between two stakes. Yes, 
There's another way we can do this. Who's familiar with a three, four, five triangle? So now we are going to have to pick two points. Okay, I need two volunteers. One grab each end of that string. Well, it should meet together pretty well in the center. If not, we'll adjust them a little bit. Okay, one's a little bit too long. Pull them until they're even. And let's go ahead and cut the excess off the one. And it doesn't really matter where on the string you put your thing, as long as you pull tight, it will always be perpendicular. Now, can we have a twist and oh. two? Is that? No. Actually, I can fix that right here. Okay. okay, so now let's come down, hold your end right above the other string, and move out until you're both. The end of your string is directly over the rope. Here? Keep going. Oh, keep going. Until that snake oh. intersects the Oh, tree. I see. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So the end of each thing is right at it. Yep. Daddy. Okay. Is that correct? Yep. That should be nice. You need a stick. Yep, there's two stakes there. Let me go ahead and stick it in. Go ahead and write it right through there. Ouch. 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 Okay, now, you see, he drove this, or I, someone drove this stake in earlier. Give me two. And, yes. We drove this stake in here. So now we have a sundial that will tell us when noon is, according to the sun. Wow, that's cool. Yep. That's when the sun has reached the highest point. That should be accurate to within, let's say, 15 minutes. Did you see that steak we just drove in? That's going to be moving. The tip of that I'll never moves. <laughs> okay, it looks like you're playing both. Is it an hour and 15 minutes? Is it daylight savings? I think. Yeah. No, we're on daylight savings. Oh, just this. It's at 1 o'clock. And here we're actually pretty close to the 120 degree longitude that would be. But a lot of times, we're more dependent on working out of familiarity with our area of operation. I need to go pretty wide. Now it's nice if we can have a map. I have a couple of maps in here. How many of you are familiar with national forest maps? You buy them from the ranger station or wherever. So I'm not sure what the name of the national forest is here. But if you go to the Forest Service headquarters, they usually have a map that they'll sell you for their national forest. Those are the ones I use the most for general hiking and running around because they cover a large area. They tell you where the roads are, where the trails are, where the water is, and who owns the land. Whether it's private, national forest, BLM, or state. Sometimes they'll tell you which timber company owns it. What is BLM? Bureau of Land Management. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Bureau of Land Management usually has to do with mining rights as much as anything mining and grazing, water rights, as national forest is timber. Um, so, 
in general, on federal land, it's public. Anyone can go there, they can walk. They may be able to ride a motorcycle or an ATV or drive a truck, depending on what the rules are. The camping regulations can vary. Same with timber company. So if you know who owns the land, you can read up on it. You can know what the rules are, you can play by the rules, and stay out of trouble. And if someone tries to give you trouble, and you know the rules better than they do, you have the upper hand. So we always want to know our terrain. We want to know our whereabouts. And that gives us strength. Now, private land. Private land, sometimes it's timber company. Timber company has their set of rules. You can read their rules. Maybe they haven't posted on the internet. But if it's other corporations or private individuals, you might have to get permission from one of them. Sometimes, in dire emergencies, we have to break the rules. And then run the risk. As much as possible, we want to live peaceably with all men. And maps and navigation are a wonderful aid in living, living peaceably. Even if we are fugitives. Or if we're just recreating, or if we're out gathering wild resources. How many of you are familiar with topographical maps? Shows the mountains and elevations. Yeah, topographical map is like if you're looking at the Earth horizontally, and you sliced it into slices, however thick, what would the shape of that slice be looking down from the top? Circle. So topographical lines, you'll have it divided up into elevation or the sea level. So by watching those lines, you can tell what shape the ground is, where the mountains are, where the valleys are. Now, the national forest maps I have don't have topographic lines, but I have other maps that have topographic lines. But on the Forest Service map, what do we have? We have rivers, creeks, lakes, and they mark mountain tops with elevations. And the newer ones have GPS coordinates. Mm -hmm. So you can learn to coordinate your GPS. I haven't done a lot of GPS map work. But they usually along the edges have your land latitude and longitude marked on the map, often within 10 minutes of angle. And you can calculate based on those minutes of angle for the rest of the map. The property descriptions, they'll often say, you know, section such and such, northwest corner. I mean, northwest quarter. So now you're in an area half a mile square. Two minutes. And then from that half a mile, it'll divide it into quarters again. So now you're in a sixteenth of a square mile, which is 80 acres, I believe. So you've gone from 640 acres in the section, 160 in a quarter section. And no, it's 40 acres in a 16th. So you've narrowed it down to a 40 acre cluster. So now, if we just end up out in the woods, we need to not get lost. We're in a totally unfamiliar area, we've never been there before. It's a cloudy day, it's at night, or whatever. What's the most important thing to not do. Get lost. Penny. Number one, don't take your backpack off and set it down and walk away. Your backpack probably has your fire starter and your extra clothing and your water bottle and other stuff you really ought to have. Make life a whole lot easier. So don't set it down and walk away. Keep it on. Mark a spot. 
and then investigate a spiral going out. The brushier it is, probably the more time you'll need to spend spiraling out or probing out in different directions until you're thoroughly familiar with that area. And once you have an area that you're familiar with, then you've taken time to analyze where you want to shelter yourself, where you're going to start looking for water, and care for all your other needs. So that's the first thing. Get familiar with an area. Stop and think about how you're going to rebuild civilization. That's basically what you're there for. Unless you need to go to another place. As long as you're here, you're going to be rebuilding civilization. So once you get that figured out, yes, you can take your pack off. You can start building your shelter. You can start purifying your water when you need to. But if you have more than one person, you can have one person stay with the stuff, one person go out exploring. Like you can call back and forth or whistle back and forth. As long as you're within hearing distance, you can keep those two people from getting separated. You don't want to lose your people. Two lost people together is much better than one than two lost people that can't find each other. So then, Psalm 104. It's talking about the water cycle, about God sends the springs into the valleys that run along the hills, and how it waters everything. And it says, they go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys. I didn't think about it so much when I lived in open country, where you could see for miles from most places. When I moved to the forest, where your visibility is often less than 100 yards, just because of the trees. I learned real fast that there's a lot of wisdom in that verse. In the Hebrew, it just says, they go up the mountains, or go up the mountains, go down the valleys. Now we know the water blows in from the ocean, it blows up onto the mountains and drops, and then it runs down the valley. When we're hiking, it's much easier Okay, let's say you're climbing this tree here. As long as you're climbing, now let's say it's a hardwood tree with a bunch of branches going this way and that to eat the corn. Um, does the fact that you're climbing the tree decide which branch you're going to end up on? You could end up anywhere in that tree. Now, if you're coming down the tree and you keep coming to where the branch is larger and the trunk is larger and you keep coming to where it's bigger and bigger and bigger, where are you going to be? You'll end up right at the bottom of the tree. Every time. And it doesn't matter which part of the tree you started in. So, let's say we go out hiking today. Let's say we start walking up a river or paddling up a river. Let's say we start coming up the Columbia River. Now you can go upstream and upstream and upstream, and eventually you'll get to where it's too small for your boat, and you have to get out and wait. And eventually you'll get beyond that to where the water completely, you reach the spring, the water is just coming out of the ground. Same thing. Where are you? You're somewhere in the Columbia River drainage. But now if you're out there in that drainage somewhere, and you go downstream, where are you going to end up? The ocean. You're going to end up at a very specific point on the coast. It's called the mouth of the Columbia River. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> so you could have come from a huge area, and just by following it downhill, you end up at a specific point. That's the same when we go up here. Let's say we go out here, and we just go uphill. We're going to end up on this volcano back here. Because that's where you'll go if you keep going uphill. 
You get up on there and you look around and say, hmm, where's home? You had no problem getting to the top of the volcano because that way's up. Well, you go down, you could end up anywhere. But if you know which creek to go down, it'll end you up in the Sprag River drainage instead of some other drainage. You can follow the creek down and end up on Sprag River. And then you can follow it down and pretty soon you're going to end up, if you don't get here first, you'll probably get to Chillicothe. So those are some pretty predictable locations you're going to end up if you climb that volcano and just head downhill, not going to turn around. Now, remember the story we started out with. Um, those boys were adrift in the ocean. There were paths of probable drift. They didn't have their motor running, they weren't paddling hard, they weren't using a sail to go across. But they had ocean currents and they had wind. Now, you remember the navigator Brian. He had maps and experience that showed which way the currents go, how fast they go. He had an idea of how fast the wind was blowing, how fast the wind would cause them to drift. And he could calculate based on wind and current, based on a general starting location, how far they would go in a given amount of time. So that's why he gave Dr. Turnbull a set of GPS locations to search. You know, they might have drifted around in a curve, but the ocean maps show those curves. So he could kind of predict that. So, as it turned out, the end of the area he mapped helped him locate it. Locate the boat with the boys and bring them back to safety. After about 48 hours of drift. To be sure they were happy and had, had good water to drink. A few days out in the sun, out in the cold. It's the same in the mountains. So remember, they go up the mountains, they go down in valleys. I have a neighbor who's grown up out in ranch and mountain environments. He's about 70 some years old now. But he often worked with search and rescue. When they would get a call, that someone was lost in this drainage. Now they're last seen here, they're going out to hunt elk or something, and they came up missing. He would sit down and say, okay, that was how many hours ago? And he would look at the map of the train. He'd know that, you know, they'd probably run in circles for a while. But the mountains have ways of following people. I don't know how many of you have tried to walk down a ridge in heavy timber. You know, ridges don't just have a nice, smooth slope with a straight line that takes you where they go. They twist and they turn and they go up and down. And there's little ridges going out the sides all over the place. Covered with brush. And it's real easy to get off on those side ridges. And if you do, you'll be running out this ridge thinking you're going where you want to, and all of a sudden the ridge is going, and you're at the creek. So guess where you go from there? Down the creek. Unless you really want to run up the next ridge. Well, sometimes you do if you know where you're going. But if you don't know where you're going, you're probably not going to work that hard. So, based on some simple predictive navigation, he was able to tell the search and rescue team, okay, he'll probably come out here. If he's passed out already, he'll probably be here next. And if he's passed out already, he'll probably be there next. 
So they could send one man here, one man here, one man there, and look for tracks. This guy said, oh, yeah, there he goes, his tracks. The guy down there said, don't see anything yet. He said, oh, well, just sit tight. The guy down there says, well, we haven't seen him here yet either. So, you have one person who says he's passed, and he starts tracking him down the valley. Man number two sits on a stump, and man number three stays warm in his car. So, either the man tracking, following his tracks, is going to find him, or he's going to stumble onto the man sitting on the stump. And they catch him every time. You know, not that they're trying to catch him. Most of them wanted to be found. But whether you want to be found or not, that's what they'll do. So, there may be, go ahead. Chris, um, people should know that if they ever get in a situation where they don't have water, mm -hmm. that in an emergency situation, you can save your life uh, by recycling your urine. You can live for a long time like that. Yeah. Solar still? Well, I'm talking about just straight drinking it. Uh, I mean, yeah, solar still is great if you can pull that off. But, sure. Um, you know, the main problem with drinking it is you're going to be concentrating your salt. So you pee for a reason. What about? I mean, she reminded me something. What about if you are lost, where to find water? I mean, I hear with my children we, when we talk, we say, you see a tree that is like birch tree or aspen tree, it means there is water. Yes. So those kind of water. yeah. So then you can go to those trees and try to dig or something. You can find something. That can you also. Repeat that question in the mic. Yes. Uh -huh. The same. When you're out, how do you find water? Um, you're in the desert, hiked up. Some elevations, that's one thing to remember, like James says, in dry areas, if you go to higher elevation, that's actually going to be more likely to get water. Um, but you look for shady areas, you look for narrow canyons, and yes, water runs downhill. Just in a dry environment, you get more moisture at high elevations. And it soaks into the ground early on, and we don't have it at lower elevations. But I'm not a desert expert, but I do know that the desert experts spend a lot of time learning how to find water. And once they master it, they can predictably navigate based on the probability of finding water. Mm -hmm. Another thing yeah, people need to know, and not just in emer these kind of emergency situations, but um, we haven't found them. We're, we're living in a time where it's really dangerous yeah. to go to hospitals, mm -hmm. and a, a lot of times the reason why a person a person gets sick, maybe they get the flu or who knows what, uh, and and they get dehydrated, you know, and now they've got to go to the hospital because they dehydrated. Well, um, we don't have to go to the hospital because we're dehydrated and we can, it, you, you get so dehydrated that you can't drink water is what happens. And, uh, but what you can do is get in water, you know, uh, get in the water. Your, everyone's hand has a hydro, if you have a hand, you have a hydrometer. And um, the, the blood vessels, when you stay in there long enough to get re- hydrated, your blood vessels will pop up on the back side of your hand, uh -huh. and then you won't be nauseated anymore. Okay. So then you can start drinking, you'll be able to tolerate water and things, but now you've got to mineralize. Mm -hmm. So when in your backpacking uh, equipment, you know, yeah, you got to keep in mind, i got to stay attached to water, but if you ever do get dehydrated, now you got to remineralize. You're not going to be able to eat until you fix the mineralization. And you can do that with uh, whole, whole salt yes, uh, and uh, rehydrate those or, or put it in your water and, um, you know, that's how you can fix that problem. Mm -hmm. If you go to the hospital, they're going to give you IVs with either um, sugar or salt, you know, so you just have your own in your backpack and have your mind prepared that you could handle that emergency and you're not going to panic and fall apart yes. about it. 
sure it and is uh, many people run to the hospital that don't need to go if they could just think about getting the bathtub. You know, I've had people, uh, cancer victims, you know, that I was taking care of, oh, gotta go to the hospital now, I'm dehydrated. No, you don't. Go get in that bathtub. And they didn't believe me. You know, oh no, that's not gonna work. And stay in there, and, and, and sure enough, it did work. You know, you got them past it. Right. So it's a valuable tool. Okay, so what she's saying is, with dehydrated people, you can get dehydrated to the point where you can no longer drink water without vomiting it. So the first thing to do is actually put the whole person in the water, get them down where they can absorb water through the skin. Um, some cases, if you have the equipment, I guess an enema might help too. But um, the best thing is to stay hydrated. When we're out exercising, it's real easy to get dehydrated. But one of the quick tests you can do to tell if you're dehydrated is you pinch yourself, your skin should go right back down again, flat. If it stays up, that's what they call tenting. So on the ambulance, we look for that all the time. When we have a patient as part of our check, we'll feel their skin and look for color and sweat and everything, and we'll just pinch them a little bit and see if their skin goes back flat. And that gives us a in a survival book that you can always have water if you have the right equipment on you, that you simply dig a hole and you put a vessel, a bowl or something, a cup down in there, and anything that sweats will give you water. So yeah. I'm not sure just what that equipment is. So but she's a clear plastic. Plastic. So, so she's talking about a solar still. Okay, so you dig a hole you put a vessel down in that hole, mm -hmm. and then you put that plastic over, and it sweats, and you would have water no matter where you are, mm -hmm. if you have enough sunlight. Yeah. Chris, mm -hmm. another thing about, uh, if you're working with somebody that cannot get in a bathtub, you know, sometimes people are too sick for that, you can always do a foot bath. If they have feet, and if they don't have feet, put their arms in tubs, mm -hmm. you know. Cover them with wet cloths or yeah. something. Right. Mm -hmm. and the other point she made that I haven't said over the microphone yet is for rehydrating a person for electrolytes, if you can get one of the good salts, pure seawater or one of the whole salts, they're usually a wet salt, they're not, they don't dry out completely, but that has all the minerals in it. That, like a Celtic Himalayan salt? Yeah, Celtic salt, Himalayan right. salt, real salt. Mm -hmm. What about if we don't have any salt? We can, I mean, any dirt with, with minerals. Um, mm. You can try feeding them dirt, but... Um, you know, you know, you know what I would do if I, if I had absolutely nothing? <laughs> I would take dirt and put it in water and let it settle out. Yep. And, yeah. and there's going to be some minerals in there. Yes. Yeah. Desperate times. I think that's probably a good idea. You can test it and see. But like she's saying, especially in cases where a person has distilled water, and you know, they call it hungry water, it tends to leach minerals out of you. I think a lot of those water issues could be solved just by putting some subsoil, you know, sand, limestone powder, something in the water. Just let it settle out. Mm -hmm. And whatever the water's hungry for, it can grab out of that, and then you'll have more of a neutral medium. Yeah. What about clay? Clay would be the same thing, just a little. That's the best, but if there's no clay, it, whatever you have. Yeah, exactly. That's why groundwater is relatively safe, and even rainwater has a certain amount of minerals in it, right. out of the air. With, with the solar still, you can add, put some vegetation in the too, yeah. Yes. And well, the solar still you want to put every wet thing you can in there. And you can purify water by putting green uh, vegetation in there. Mm -hmm. It'll it'll pull all the toxins out. Right. And uh, another thing to know is all dirt has some clay. Mm -hmm. And I've done amazing things when when I learned about people using clay therapy, and I didn't have any clay, and I had issues. I just went out and got garden dirt and made poultices yeah. and had absolutely miraculous things going on with that. Yeah. Instead of the clay. 
Yeah, I didn't have clay. Yeah. I just used mud and dirt. Mm -hmm. And also, I've, I've resolved anaphylactic shock with that, too. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter got stung with a hornet one day, and she wouldn't let me help her. I wanted to put charcoal. No, no, no. And she's an asthmatic. And with within an hour, she was, you know, and it was too late to take her anywhere. We had to do something. And I just went out and dumped water on the ground and got a handful of mud yes. and brought it back. And just as fast as I put it on there and it got hot, 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 and I'd go out there and make another one. And she kept me running for like 45 minutes, just back and forth, and it was just screaming hot. And we got her through it, you know. And she, the very next day, it happened again in the same spot. Mm. Only that time she let me get right on it, and within 45 minutes we were done. Mm. But I learned this is what you do in the wilderness for anaphylactic shock, you know. Mm. Yeah. Unless you are in a desert, also, even grass can give you a lot of water yeah. or trees. Yeah, it's true. You can get chewed, you don't have to swallow yeah. the water. Uh, you can spit out, but you can just get yeah. the water. Christopher? Yeah. Yes. Another thing, you know, when someone is maybe lost or something, uh, the chance of uh, hypothermia, mm -hmm. and with hypothermia, you can go into a cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. So right. you need to stay warm. Yeah. Well, Chris, can I share another thing I just learned? Okay. I met a man that um, when he was a little boy, uh, he asked a lot of questions and got his parents mad at him. And uh, he was asking, why is it the cows and all the animals, they just eat grass and we have to have all this complicated food? Why can't we eat simply like them? Mm -hmm. And uh, when Ann Wigmore had her school in Boston and was learning how to use wheatgrass to help people get well, mm -hmm. he was her first student. He's, mm -hmm. he's 86 now. I just oh, met him. He just came to my house last What's week. Uh, I have to remember. Okay. Um, but um, he, he said eventually he learned, he also went to Australia and learned a, a, from a, a lady that was working with uh, Aboriginal remedies and herbs and uh, you know, he spent his life learning these things. And he, he learned that if you, if you chew the wheatgrass and swallow it, uh, he said he saw amazing things with Ann Wigmore. But if you eat the grass, everybody gets well way faster than anything she could ever pull off. <laughs> so I thought really? that was pretty. He said yeah. you need the, the uh, yeah, bulk of the fiber yeah. going through yeah. the colon. And if you get that, she said it's it's just it, it's amazing how fast you can heal. I thought that was pretty amazing. You know, the grass under all our rock feet, where can you go where you don't at least have that? Well, you think of Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. You think of Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. He lived on okay. it. Um, we need to wrap up. We have about five minutes left. So I think we'll go back in and look at notes a little bit. And yeah. ...object, just mechanically, based on two readings and one known distance. So that's something we can do on the ground or on paper. How many of you understand what beelining is? Okay, beelines are named after honeybees because they like to fly straight to the nectar source from the hive once they find it. If they have a big tree with lots of flowers, they'll just make a beeline for it. Back and forth. That way you don't have wasted energy. Um, so, let's say we can see a distant mountain. But to get there, we're going to lose sight of that mountain. So what we can do is we can take a compass heading on that mountain, and then pick a point that we can see the distance all the way from where we are to that point with our compass. Now we may not be able to walk straight to it, but we can not lose sight of it until we get to it. We might have to walk around a stump or around a bend in the creek or something before we can get there. So we take our compass or line up with the mountain, but we need the number on our compass. We need to get our bezel set so that we can 
continue traveling in the same direction. So from here, we walk to that point. Once we get to that point, we use our compass. And using the same heading, we pick another object that we can get to without getting lost. We walk to that object. Then we take another heading, pick another object, and walk to it. And if we keep going, we'll end up on top of that mountain. And we won't get lost in the process. Now, if you have a map, you may not even be able to see that distant mountain, but you can measure on your map and get the angle. That's where you're going to have to know your magnetic declination, because you have to match your magnetic north to true north. So, once again, you measure on your map, get your angle, figure in your declination, and set the bezel on your compass. So then, every time, you just make sure the needle's on the north mark, wherever it's pointed, orient yourself so the needle's pointing the right direction, and pick your next point. So whether you do it in two stages, or 20 stages, or 200 stages, you'll be reasonably close. The more accurate you are, the more accurate you'll be. So we've discussed learning to understand the movements of the sun, the moon, and the stars. You should be able to get a general idea of direction within an hour by observing a portion of the sky. You shouldn't have to see the North Star to get a general idea because, in a known area at least, stuff rises in the east, it sets in the west. So when you see that portion of an arc, just know it's going from east to west around the backside. Now, if you're looking north, you're going to see it coming down and going back up again. If you're looking west, it's going to be coming down. If you're looking east, it's going to be coming up. If you're looking south, it's just going to be arcing across the top. But I think that becomes common sense pretty quickly. But again, where the challenge really comes is in the fog, in the dark, in unfamiliar terrain, where you can't see the sun, the moon, or the stars. Another point about the moon. When you have a half a moon, first quarter, last quarter, you see the top and the bottom of the moon that's going to be pointing somewhat south. The closer you are to the equator, the more it'll be south. Up in Alaska, it's not such a good indicator, but farther south, it helps. You know, it's going to be pointing down somewhat toward the south. But I would encourage everyone here to get a compass that's functional. You should be able to take a two degree bearing and the ones I have for sale here actually have a gear drive that you can physically set the declination. So if you know that we have a 14 degree declination here you just dial it in and from there on you have no real issues with coordinating the map with magnetic north. So that's a really handy feature on these compasses I have. There's other ways to do it, but it's a little more complex.